this week on the Back Table Podcast. Every day when I am at work, I make it a point that I'm going to talk to at least one clinician about a certain patient that may benefit from something that I do. And that may be based off of a biopsy that I had done on their patient or a CT scan that I read or something like that. And using that as kind of an excuse in a way to reach out to that physician. And if you do that once a day, every day for two years, that's going to be a ton of phone calls or text messages or whatever. And that will add up. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. Now a quick word from our sponsor. One of the biggest challenges clinicians face is not related to devices or techniques. It's the workflow. For conditions like aortic emergency, PE, and stroke, outcomes are impacted because it takes too long for treatment decisions to be made and for patients to receive therapy. Viz AI leverages artificial intelligence to coordinate care and improve workflow and is trusted in over 1,000 hospitals across the U.S. and in Europe. The platform uses AI to detect disease, provide access to high-fidelity imaging and patient information, and allows you to communicate securely through the HIPAA-compliant communication tool conveniently on your phone, desktop, or within the radiology workstation. No more asking the ED to send you a grainy picture or making countless phone calls to activate your teams. Visit viz.ai to learn more. And now back to the show. This is Michael Barraza recording as your host. Today, we're going to talk about practice building in a traditional IR, DR practice. And I'm honored to welcome you know, my friend and formal colleague, Dave Johnson. Dave, thanks for joining us today. Hey, how's it going, Mike? Good, man. You know, for our listeners, Dave and I go back. Dave and I train together at Vanderbilt, and he's still, you know, one of the, the first people I go to if I have any anything I want to discuss work-related that I don't want to talk to anybody else at work about. And we talk about a lot of stuff, you know, work-related and practice building, and it's been an interesting thing for me being able to admire from afar the practice that Dave has built. Dave has, in addition to building a very robust IR practice in general, has grown probably the one of, if not the largest PAE practices in private practice in the Southeast. Dave, where are you today? I'm in Fort Myers, Florida. You guys recovered fully from the hurricane? Yeah, at least for my house we are, but unfortunately the town took a really big hit, you know, certain parts of the town, especially the beach communities, Sanibel, Fort Myers Beach, some of the other barrier islands like Pine Island took a really substantial hit and really devastating for those people down there and for those businesses as well. As you know, the economy down here is so dependent on tourism. So people are cleaning up and uh, will be rebuilding. And it was obviously a very bad situation, but you know, it's something we're going to bounce back from. Thank you for asking. How long have you been there? I've been here for about five and a half years now. So this was my first job out of training. And how did you find the job? Yeah. When I was a resident, I know you, you actually had found a job and I was like, well, like maybe I should start looking for a job myself. You know, we had been talking and I was like, okay, like this is the opportunity to, to actually start looking for, for jobs. If Mike found a job, like maybe I should be on the ball too. So, you know, I put out feelers, uh, used some of contacts that I had made and actually use job boards as well. In fact, the job I found was actually via the job board. So there's pluses and minuses of finding a job via a job board, but certainly that's you know one of the easier places to look. And I think you just need to be able to put out feelers at a lot of places because there's going to be jobs out there that you know are going to be good setups for a good career. And maybe there's other jobs that won't be optimal for that career that you want. So, I mean, you know, you're obviously not alone in this. Susie obviously was looking for a job at the same time as wife Susie is at ER doc. Did that make it any harder to search for a job? No. I mean, no and yes. So no, because, you know, everywhere there's going to be jobs for physicians, right? So there's going to be a job for you somewhere. And if you're in a two physician family, it does add a little bit of complexity, but part of it depends on how strict you are in the type of jobs that you want. For example, if both partners want a very specific type of job, it may be extremely difficult to make both people happy. 
So I think you need to be able to have some flexibility if you're in that sort of situation. You need to know what you want, but you also can't let the best be the enemy of the good either. Totally agree. So Dave, what did you want when you were looking and, and why did this look like the right fit, at least starting out? I was remarkably naive about what to look for in a job coming out of training. Yeah. So I wasn't dead set on a 100% IR job or a job where I was doing IR and DR in the same practice. For me, I knew that I needed to have that flexibility of being able to do a variety of things potentially in a job that I sought out. But, you know, I know I definitely wanted to do a lot of interventional radiology in my job, no matter how much IR or DR mixture I was going to be expected to do. And one thing that I specifically was looking for was a situation where I could come into a practice and be able to build an IR practice. I think that some places are better for that than others. Yeah, I think it's an important point for trainees. You know, when you're looking for jobs, like not every job when you start out is going to be exactly what you want it to look like in a few years. One of the things that really matters is that that job and staff there are willing and capable to let that job evolve to fit your needs. And, you know, I know in both jobs that I've had since training, what they look like now is not exactly how they looked when I started. And I, I know that was the case for you, right? Yeah. And you have to be able to evolve the job that you're at. It can't be the same job year one as year four or year five. And there's going to be that evolution in the way the practice is going to be run in the variety of cases that you may be able to perform and in what you're able to perform and essentially build as an interventional radiologist. There could be some places where it's very, very difficult to change what happens in terms of what sort of cases can be done what sort of practice can be built. And those are maybe the jobs that if you can see that ahead of time to try to avoid potentially, if, especially if you are interested in building a practice and you know trying to do a specific type of procedure or types of procedures. So when you started your job, did it look, beginning at least, what it, you thought it was going to look like when you started? I mean, that was kind of the glaring thing for me in my first job is what I had, the picture I'd painted in my head of what this job was going to look like was dramatically different from reality. Yes and no. So I knew what I was getting myself into. I knew my job was a mixed interventional radiology and diagnostic radiology type of practice where there was a significant component of diagnostic radiology. And so I went in that with very clear eyes and I knew what was going to be expected of me and the variety of work that I was going to be expected to do in the job that I took. That being said, one thing that I saw in this environment was that there was a lot of potential for growth. And that potential for growth is one of the biggest things that I can recommend anyone to look for in a job if they're interested in building an interventional radiology practice. So did you, I mean, you noticed that right off the bat, did you immediately start trying to build things or did you wait for a little while and kind of settle in and, and meet people, including referring doctors? Yeah, so it takes a while to build a practice. I don't think this is something that is very easily done in a year or even two or three years. This is a very, very long game that you're going to have to play. So for example, when I first started, I was coming out of training and honestly, I was very conservative coming out. I didn't want to do procedures that I was worried that I was going to cause significant complications on and kind of deviating from what maybe some of my older partners were doing. And part of the reason is when you're new and out of training, one, you're inexperienced. Two, you don't have the backing of the attending who's in the control room who can bail you out and save the day. And three, if you do have a complication, you don't want it to solely your reputation in the community, especially when you're brand new and people don't know you from anyone else out there. They don't care where you trained. They don't care how good you potentially are. They only see what happens. Yeah, funny, Dave. I was kind of the opposite coming out. I came out much more aggressive than I am now. I'm, I'm still fairly aggressive, but I, I came out super aggressive, maybe a, a little bit overconfident. And I came out of the gates just trying to build everything and anything. And I look back on it and it would do it differently. And, in, you know, in my current job, I, I took a little time before really trying to grow certain things because when I started my first job, 
I'd been on the ground for like a month and I'm calling, I'm calling urologists, oncologists, radiation oncologists, telling them like, let me ablate this. Let me stint that. And they're like, who the hell are you? We have not worked with you. And so, you know, it brought a couple of people the wrong way. And so now the job I'm in now, where I've been for, you know, about two and a half years, I told myself before trying to build anything like prostatic artery embolization or anything that doesn't directly fall to an IR department normally, I was going to spend some time getting to know some of these doctors, doing some good work on their patients, and then start asking. And it's worked. It worked better for me this time around. But for you, once you decided it was time to start growing, did you try to build everything at once or did you take one thing at a time or just kind of look at areas where there was a glaring need and kind of start one at a time? Yeah, I looked for areas that were in need in my community where I felt like I could help out with what the other physicians needed. And one thing to keep in mind is these physicians are trusting you with their patients and they want their patients to have good outcomes, for their patients to be happy. They don't want to have sent their patient to someone who didn't do a good job or didn't treat care of their patients well. And so definitely, you know, building that trust is huge from the beginning, especially as a new physician in a practice, whether you're young or old, but particularly if you're younger. But getting back to your question about what I marketed initially, I tried to build multiple different service lines initially. And part of the reason is you kind of have to see what sticks. There may be certain procedures or disease states that are more prevalent in your community, or there may be physicians that are more readily willing to refer patients to you for certain reasons, or physicians that may be less willing to refer patients to you for certain reasons. And because of that, you really need to be able to feel things out. And even if you have a certain area of interventional radiology that you really want to build, that you feel like you can build this great service line, you know, that may not necessarily be possible in your local milieu. Dave, one thing that, you know, a lot of people in traditional IR, combined IR, DR practices run into, and something that I ran into, you know, my first job was, it's kind of hard to balance practice building with the daily responsibilities of being on the ground and covering DR. I found that would go see somebody on the floor or wanted to stop by a clinic or wanted to give a presentation, stuff like that. And and in my first time, I kind of found that it was something I really needed to be doing on my own time. How have you navigated that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the way that I visualize this is that there is a short game and a long game. And so, for example, if your practice has some quota or RVU number that you're supposed to hit per day or something like that. That's obviously like a short game. Like you, you got to meet that goal. And obviously that's important at some level, but if all you focus on is the short game, you're never going to be able to achieve your goals in the long game. So one thing is that you always have to keep in mind every day what your long game is and have that vision. Okay. So for example, every day when I am at work, I make it a point that I'm going to talk to at least one clinician about a certain patient that may benefit from something that I do. And that may be based off of a biopsy that I had done on their patient or a CT scan that I read or something like that. And using that as kind of an excuse in a way to reach out to that physician. And if you do that once a day, every day for two years, that's going to be a ton of phone calls or text messages or whatever. And that will add up. Now, each individual message or phone call that you make probably is going to be very low yield. That's the reality of it. You may not get a single referral. But what I have found is that some of these physicians that I've made contacts with, a year or two later, they come out of the woodwork and they start sending you referrals. And there's no real good way to explain it aside from the fact that there was a long game that I was playing in the past that eventually starts paying dividends in the future. And a lot of that comes down to just these other physicians knowing who you are and what you do. And you have to be able to have explained that to them in some point in the past by whatever means is necessary. And so, for example, if you are in a situation where it's hard to get out and market yourself, you need to just be able to get on the phone when you can. Man, I think that's such a great point. And looking at it in short game and long game is 
really a, a great way for trainees to look at it. I mean, reading CT scans and doing diagnostic, I mean, you can really build a lot of work from that. I don't know how many messages, texts, or epic messages I sent or received based on diagnostic studies that I'm hoping will come to something on the interventional side. But, you know, on the other end of that, you shouldn't be necessarily above any procedure because bigger things can come from that. I mean, look at a paracentesis, you know, you do that well, you keep working with these patients, you're going to be the guy that they go to for tips, for example. There's no job is unimportant in IR. Right. Like, for example, with urology, you know, there's super pubic catheters, which are probably the least glamorous procedure that we do. For gynecology, there's neck splenon removals. Which you've gotten pretty good at. The the super pubic tubes? Yeah. You're, 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 yeah. Uh, what, what is it, the BASP? I take any credit for this, but uh, my mentor. Uh, you can take a little credit. Peter Bream. He taught me how to do this. and it, You didn't say bag. No, well, well, he claims to have invented the bag, which is, you know, the balloon-assisted gastrostomy. And, and, and uh, Well, yeah, I know that, but no, what about the bass? And the bass, the balloon-assisted suprapubic tube is basically the same thing, except for placement of a suprapubic tube. And, and you can think of the urinary bladder just like a stomach. In fact, it's actually a safer procedure because it's not a uh, intraperitoneal organ. And it's really easy to visualize sonographically. So it's, uh, you know, it's not a glamorous procedure. There's a lot of urine involved, but, and it can be kind of a mess, but I don't shy away from that. No, we're going to call it the Johnson Super Pubic Catheter Technique now. So you're just talking about using, you know, I mean, how we're working, you're working with urology doing Super Pubic Catheter placements. Yeah. And, and even like other specialties with oncology, you know, you can think of ports and biopsies and, gastroenterology, your, your routine GI bleeds and the gastrostomy tubes. You can go down the line with all these specialties and find things that you can help them out with that may be easier things to sell to them because they're just stuff that they may not want to be involved with or give their patients a lot of trouble. For example, like if you're a gynecologist and you, they can remove a next one on just fine 99% of the time, but they have these difficult cases where they can't get it out or they can't visualize it or they can't feel it and they can use our help. And I mean, this is a very, very small part of my practice, but it's something that I've built and have gotten a good number of referrals for and definitely endears you to these physicians. Absolutely. You become a reliable person to them and and somebody who to call when they need help, you know, and it it could be for any number of reasons. You work enough with the right person and and you're going to become that person for them. I mean, they're Lots of different ways you can help. It's one of the great things about this job. And this is why like as a like a hospital based IR, that's one of your superpowers is that you are getting asked to do a bunch of different things that just kind of naturally come to you. And a lot of those things may be the stuff that's not very sexy or interesting, but it is a way for you to demonstrate your skills. And especially as a new interventional radiologist, if you're just out of training, it's a great way not only to get kind of those reps, so to speak, but also to get your name out in the community of like, hey, like I was doing this on your patient. I was doing this biopsy and then this happened, but we were able to fix it. Or, hey, I did this biopsy on your patient and hey, I think I can help out with this guy. You know, you have to tailor it to each individual situation. And that's why, you know, unfortunately, it's kind of vague because really every patient scenario is so unique and you have no idea what you're fellow physicians out there really, really need unless you talk to them. Totally. It is vague. And I think a lot of what I've asked you is vague in terms of practice building. So I think something that I think would be really helpful to our listeners is to take a specific example. And the obvious one for you is PAE, how you took that from something that didn't exist in Fort Myers to, as I said, being one of the the largest PAE practices in the Southeast, probably. So I want to know how and when you looked at this and decided this was going to be a target and where you went from there. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because this is like a back table success story because I don't know if it was like December 2017 or January 2018, you had some podcast, I think it was like episode 17, where you were talking to Ari Isaacson and Sonny Bagla about PAE. And I remember you talking to them and telling them like, hey, like, you know, at a scale of like one to 10, PAE is a nine. And I'm like, huh, like, I guess I could probably figure this out. That's what I was, that I was taught that in training. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I could, I could, this is like a challenge. Like I could try to do this. And, you know, I knew that in my area, like demographically, like there were patients, it wasn't like, uh, we're a bunch of young people down here where I live in Florida. 
So I knew that, you know, it was a market where I could potentially grow and get that sort of patient referral base sent into me. And then also it was appealing to me just from a making myself a better physician and interventional radiologist as well. I mean, this isn't no offense to doing the super pubic tubes or other kind of basic procedures like ports, but like, you know, there's only so much that you can really improve upon those procedures and get really better. Whereas prostate artery embolization, I believe, you know, you can always get better. I think even the experts always feel that there's so much more to learn about the procedure and there's so many challenges with each procedure. So from that perspective, I was interested in in doing the procedure as well. It's definitely not for the faint of heart for people that just want to do quick in and out cases and just go home at the end of the day and not have to worry about things. But I knew it was something that I was interested in and that there was a community need and that it was something that I could actually grow. So from there, I took it upon myself to try to learn how to do prostate artery embolization. And how'd you do that? So I did the stream course. Um, that was like the first thing that I did. Me too. And it was a great experience. I have no association with those guys. Me either, but it's still the best resource to have come across. Yeah. So Ari and Sonny have really done a great job spreading the gospel of prostate artery embolization out there. And so uh, many thanks to them for their willingness to, to educate our community on, on the procedure. But then, you know, well, here's the thing is that it took a really, really long time to go from that point to actually getting a referral and actually doing prostate artery embolization. So it wasn't for another 18 months until I had my first referral and then I had my first patient on the table. So 18 months, again, we were talking before about the long game. So it takes a long time to build the practice potentially. It took me like two years. Yeah. In the meantime, I was doing, I, I was doing other things. There was other, there's other procedures, other kind of services that I was offering and keeping myself busy, of course. So I wasn't sitting around waiting for a prostate to come in. And part of it, you know, was marketing to urologists, some marketing towards patients, and then eventually getting those first few referrals, which are really, really the key. Because once you can get those first few referrals, then you can really show how well a procedure like PAE works. Because you can then have those patients go back to their urologist. And they can tell their urologist how well they're doing and how happy they are. And really, that is what got the ball rolling ultimately. Now, Dave, you talk about marketing to the urologist and the patients. Now, for a lot of people, myself included, the biggest challenge was getting that first urologist to send a patient. So what did you do? Like, how did you persuade the urologist to actually start sitting you work. I mean, to this day, I'm getting almost exclusively self-referred patients. Yeah. And you know, those self-referred patients may actually be a good kind of inroad here. The first few patients that I did were in a way self-referred. They maybe didn't self-refer themselves to me, but they had self-referred themselves for PAE. You know, they had done their research. They knew what prostate artery embolization was and they knew their other options and they had read about the options and they had decided that prostate artery embolization was the procedure that they had wanted. And so then they ultimately sought out someone who could do PAE. And they also essentially had to convince their urologist, hey, like, by the way, I'm going to go get this procedure done. And can I have your blessing? And, you know, sometimes the urologists were a bit hesitant to do that because they didn't know much about this procedure and they didn't have the knowledge about the literature that we do as interventional radiologists about this. But Dave, the AUA, Dave. Yeah, you know, the, the AUA, you know, <laughs> as, a, 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 as an aside, I, I've never really had a urologist bring that up. I know that it happens a lot out there. I have. And yeah, exactly. I know that it happens and it's unfortunate that the AUA hasn't really had anything positive to say. But what I would say is that, you know, I've done quite a few of these procedures in a community setting and have had some really great results with it and some very happy patients, very happy urologists who are willing to keep sending me more and more patients. So I think really from an anecdotal perspective, from what I see, it certainly (laughs) should be in some way part of the guidelines. How strict the guidelines should be about it, that's not my, my role, but the literature on PAE is very supportive of it. So it's very peculiar that the AUA has not been supportive 
of PAE beyond statements saying that, oh, it should be done in highly experienced centers under clinical trials. You know, that may have been the case five years ago. Right. But it's completely we've different. We've had so much more data come out. The landscape is totally different from when you and I first started looking at this. You know, it's funny to, to tell this story now, but like when you and I were first coming out, PA was still kind of new. And so it's a, a very much a different landscape. But then you, once you got this started, the referral stream is flowing. Did you have to do anything to keep it going and to keep that stream flowing? Yeah, and I love the urinary stream analogy there. It's just, you know, it keeps flowing. Thanks. The river the river of urine just <laughs> keeps flowing. And, you know, part of it is, you know, having good results and having that urine flow in your patients. Yeah. That, that's one thing. It's unstoppable. But, you know, part of it is just treating the patients really well, not only doing the procedure in a competent, technically proficient fashion, but having good consultations with the patient beforehand, following up with the patients. And I think it's also important if they're referred by a urologist that the patient goes and sees their urologist in a reasonable time frame after the procedure, maybe about a month or two after the procedure, once the procedure's had some time to, to work. And, you know, the urologist can see how well the patient's done and taking some ownership over the post-procedural care of the patient, I think is, is really important, even if it's just being available to talk to the patient and being able to answer their questions and hold their hand, so to speak, through the post-PAE syndrome type symptoms that some of them get. I think that's critical because you can't dump that on the urologist. And it's very similar to the oh, I agree. U- uterine artery embolizations. What's the incentive to send you patients if they're going to still get those phone calls? Like that, I try my best to handle anything I can manage in the post-procedural state, especially for something like that, where there is a competing therapy offered by someone else. Like, I don't know about you, but for a lot of these people, I, I give them my cell. I'm like, use it. Don't call your office. Call me. Yeah, I think it's really important. You want to be available for these patients. You don't want to make them feel like they've been abandoned. Part of it is, you know, again, in my practice, a lot of this is referral dependent. So these patients are already being sent from the urologist to me. So I don't know if they already kind of feel abandoned, right? Because their urologist is, in a way, dumping them onto me, perhaps. The patient could potentially feel like they're being dumped onto another physician. Oh, like my urologist can't help. And the last thing you want is then, for that patient who was already sent to another doctor that is, you know, you or me, for example, to then feel like, oh, that this radiologist, this interventional radiologist who has been caring for me or did the procedure, just did the procedure and was just a technician and did the procedure and I can't talk to them or, you know, what if I'm having an issue? So I always make it very clear to them, hey, like, here's my cell phone number. Please call me if there's any issues day or night. And some of the patients call. Some of them don't call. Most of them, in fact, don't call. But I would say there is a significant subset of patients who do have rather significant post-PAE syndrome. And there's usually not too much you need to do, but it's very important to be able to to talk to these patients and be able to work with them through that. Even if all you're doing is prescribing them a tincture of time, it's still very important to communicate to the patient exactly why this is happening to them. It's very, it's kind of scary, these symptoms of extreme urinary frequency and urgency. It's just not, it's not comfortable. These guys at baseline already have these symptoms and are already pretty miserable from it. And you're sometimes making it worse temporarily. And so it's very important to be able to chat with them after the procedure several days later, if if they need to talk to you. I agree. To me, it seems like for this and UAE, no matter how many times I tell them, you know, in clinic beforehand, like you're going to feel crappy afterwards. And I'll explain it sometimes in exquisite detail. A lot of times they're still surprised, like, wait, I thought I, I didn't realize it was going to be like this. But so I do, I think it's important to be available. Let them be able to reach you and get upset if just they call the, you know, urologist or a gynecologist office first and try to make sure I'm the first person. And in general, for practice building, especially early on, but in dealing with patients as well, I just think you kind of have to approach it. Like even when you're off, you're on for your personal patients and your personal doctors that call you for specific things. Like, I just try to be available even when I'm not. It's like, look, I can't look at it right now. Give me a couple hours when I'm home. I'll figure this out. Yeah, I think that's super important. And that's actually what makes doing things like prostate artery embolization and uterine artery embolization, I think probably the most challenging is that there's the technical and IR, the actual like in the procedure room part of the care that is important. And for example, in prostate artery embolization can be very difficult. But I think perhaps one of the more difficult things is that global picture and being able to kind of walk the patient from 
the initial referral to the point where, hey, they're better from not only the procedure, but from their baseline BPH symptoms. And then you can essentially discharge them back to the urologist at that point if, you know, once things are all better months later. And that whole process, I think, is much more challenging than, than just the procedural encounter, which itself can be difficult, but maybe actually quite easy compared to all the other components of care from that referral to that endpoint. Dave, so unlike our listeners, I am in pretty constant communication with you. So I know what your practice looks like now. And I'm curious, now that you have so much work to do with PAE, oncology, everything else, like, are you nearing a point of saturation where you kind of have to slow down your practice building? You know, you've got a lot of different types of referrals coming in from a lot of different sources. And I'm curious how you're managing that. I mean, I got to imagine you're probably starting to get booked pretty far out. Yeah, I stay pretty busy. And I also have the attitude that, you know, there's always more that I can be doing. There's things that I can be improving upon. I don't want to be stuck in just doing two or three procedures and that's it. Okay. The flip side is you're right. There's only certain amounts of time in the day and only so much that you can do. So for example, like I've not done, you know, a great job of building potential other service lines that I may be able to build. So like I'm not building a peripheral arterial disease practice because although I probably could learn how to do that stuff and be very capable at it, and take care of those patients, I think that would be a monumental undertaking on top of everything else that I'm doing right now. So you have to kind of know where where your limitations are in terms of your time, in terms of like your capabilities as well, and what you were able to kind of pick on. And ultimately, you need to be able to keep expanding your practice as it grows. And a lot of times that may be adding additional interventional radiologists to help you out and take on stuff that you may not be able to handle and having them build other kind of parts of the practice that need to be built. But also just knowing that, hey, you know, there's other procedures that you could potentially perform. You know, there's other types of, for example, embolizations that I could start pursuing if I wanted to. And I would be able to add those to my practice pretty easily if I wanted to. But, you know, it's going to take work and time. And so right now I'm not like hardcore building, you know, new service lines for what I'm doing. And part of that's because of my bandwidth. So it's a balance because you can only do so much in a day. There's only so many procedures that you can do in a day. But one thing that kind of makes me think about though, is like when you're looking at a practice, you want to look for a place where there will be bandwidth to build. So you want to have a place where there's going to be enough rooms to do the types of procedures that you want to do. If there's only You know, if you're at a hospital that's super busy and only has two rooms and they're running them all day doing inpatient dialysis catheters, it's going to be really hard to build a practice in that setting because there's probably going to be a lot of resistance to adding new service line where there's a procedure that takes two hours and it's an outpatient procedure and blows up the schedule when people end up staying late. And that's not really a fun thing to kind of try to build when when there's perhaps some internal resistance from staff. So, you know, when you're looking for a job, you want to look for a place where there's going to be not only the ability to garner referrals, but you have to be able to put them somewhere. You need to have facilities to work in, you know, whatever types of facilities those may be, you need to be able to work these patients in. Because in addition to, you know, you personally only having so much bandwidth, well, the hardware only has so much bandwidth. You can only do so many procedures in a, in a room on a given day, no matter how efficient that place is. <laughs> I remember my first year out doing a uh, five-hour PAD case in a hospital where we had one room and I didn't intend for it to take five hours. And I finished the case and everybody in the hospital was angry at me, except for, of course, the patient, I mean, the person that referred the patient. But you're you're totally right. You got to have bandwidth. So speaking of bandwidth, man, like you are also, in addition to being a, a father and individual radiologist, you are your own like fully functional clinic. And so, you know, I think it would be useful for some trainees out there, especially people who are going into an IR, DR practice that may or may not have a clinic. How do you keep up with everything in terms of, you know, scheduling and follow up and not let things fall through the cracks? Yeah. I mean, one thing that has been a challenge has been just the logistics of that and making sure you keep up with your patients. You have to have a system, okay? It doesn't matter how much staff you have or don't have. There has to be a system because these patients come in, they get referred in, they need to receive a consult. 
they may or may not need to get scheduled for a procedure. They need to have the procedure done. Hopefully they get some sort of follow up, you know, and sometimes then depending on the type of procedure, they may go back into a loop of kind of more of a consultation and procedure and follow up and so on and so forth. And that can get very, very complex very, very quickly. I initially had like a system where I was literally putting them on like a sheet of paper and like each patient would have a sheet of paper and that sheet of paper would sit in my front scrub pocket. And eventually that like stack of papers got so big. And so it looked like I had uh, some extra tissue on my front side there from all these sheets of paper. So eventually I had to go to a more digital solution. I set a lot of reminders to follow up on things. Ultimately, you're the one who's responsible for these patients. So you have to have a system where you will hold yourself accountable or at least have someone else who could be held accountable. You know, if you have, for example, a advanced practice provider, that may be a good role for them. But ultimately, like you're going to still be the one responsible. So you still have to make sure things happen. One thing that has been very helpful for me is I have a really wonderful medical assistant. She does a great job helping keep track of things for me and especially with scheduling and all that helping me manage getting my consults in and arranging kind of like appointment times for those consults. That has been very helpful. So a a good medical assistant is worth their weight in gold. Another thing that I kind of found helpful just from being from a clinical perspective is, you know, for, for patients who really when the consult is essentially just a discussion, I think doing teleconsults has been extraordinarily helpful. Really didn't do them before COVID and COVID forced us to do that. And then I realized with that, it was just much more efficient. And honestly, the patients really liked it better too, because they didn't have to like come in somewhere to a clinic and wait to be seen. Oh yeah. I got a lot of people traveling from pretty far and that can be a deal breaker for some of them. Yeah. And and, you know, for things like prostate artery embolization, I don't think you really need to physically, I mean, it's ideal to see them physically. But you're not doing a digital rectal exam. No, you know, I'm not. (laughs) So, you know, I don't think the patients need, there's not really much in terms of a physical examination like you're talking about that needs to be done on these patients. And really, they just need your time and in your attention and however you can make that happen. And again, is it ideal to see them all in person? Yes, I think that would be the ideal scenario. But again, I think in terms of throughput and in terms of being able to to run things efficiently, doing teleconsults when you can, can be helpful. But again, it, it, it's dependent on the type of procedures you do. If you're doing prostate artery embolization, it much- And the patient. Yeah, exactly. And it must be much easier for that than say peripheral arterial disease, where I think a physical examination is critical, right? Oh, it's right. Totally. So it's it, you have to kind of tailor how you run your practice to what you're doing. And I think that's very important to be able to have that sort of perspective. I'm with you. Uh, yeah, you know, even a lot of my post-procedural clinic visits, I do either tele or we just talk on the phone, especially like UAE, for example. I'm like, you know, I just, I'm texting them through the week. And then after that, I'm like, look, I can see you back in clinic for in a month or we can talk over the phone. It's up to you. And most of the time they just want to talk. Yeah. Patients vote with their feet too. Like for example, the UAEs, when I first started doing them, I really was adamant, okay, I want you to come in and see me. And I found that my ability to get a lot of those patients back to see me was was not very, the percentage wasn't as high as I would have liked. And the reality is I want to know how you're doing. How did it work? You know, I want you to tell me how, how things went. And I mean, obviously there's an issue, you know, if you need to come in, you can definitely come in. But that's the important thing is knowing how things went. And if it's easy, sometimes it's just a quick three minute phone call. And that's all it is. And that's, it can mean the world to the patient and it means the world to you. You know, when you hear like, Hey, like I had a great result. I usually text them. Like I, after a UAE, I usually text them that night and text them periodically over the next week. And then we'll either have a phone call or I text them, you know, a month later and check in every now and then. And they absolutely love it. They feel cared for. They, you know, you're not forgetting about them. I always tell the patients like, look, if you don't hear from me and you want to hear from me, call me. But sometimes, you know, just a simple text, it goes a long way. And gets back to the referring doctor, which is always great. It really does. And then you can, it's always great to be able to close the loop with the referring doctor. Be like, hey, like I chatted with patient so-and-so and and they did really well with the intervention and they're very happy. Well, Dave, what else am I missing? Is there anything else I didn't ask you that you want to discuss or any other pearls that you have for anybody currently in training, looking to grow or somebody, you know, soon to start and wanting to build a practice similar to the one you've got? So, you know, one thing I would say is when, you, when you're looking for a job, it's going to be impossible to know if that 
particular job is really going to work out in the end. If you're going to be able to, for example, if you're really interested in building a, a very vibrant interventional radiology practice, it's very hard to know at the beginning if that's going to happen or not. It may not happen. It may be a terrible situation to do that in, or it may be a great situation. So all you can do is you can know what you're getting yourself into from the beginning. So you can know, hey, like, what's your local competition like? Are there a bunch of other interventional radiologists already there? Because that can impact, you know, how much of a practice you can build. Again, what are the facilities like? You know, is there going to be room to grow? Are the facilities adequate for doing the procedures you want to do? Because you may need higher end equipment for certain interventions, whereas other interventions, you may just need a basic C arm. And then, you know, again, like, is the practice going to be one where you're going to be able to build it? You know, if you're expected to read 150 RVUs a day or something, and there's no way to do it except by sitting there and reading CTs and, and never doing a procedure, well, that's going to be really difficult as well. So you need to know your expectations and, and what the group is expecting out of you, you know, especially if you're in an IR, DR type of situation. But, you know, even if you're in an IR only practice, you know, they, they may need you to come in and basically be the guy who takes care of the crap cases and the other people there may already have built a big practice and it's hard to come in and really build the stuff that you want to build because there's already a bunch of other interventional radiologists there doing that sort of stuff. So you have to just be able to look at each local situation and that's extremely difficult. It's really easy to say, oh, you know, just figure out which place is going to be the best environment because it can change dramatically. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And at the same time, I think it's important, especially for trainees, don't go into a job expecting it to be perfect because that job doesn't exist. And so what that job looks like when you start is whether whether or not it stays that way is, is primarily up to you. You know, I mean, it's Dave said, every job is going to have different capabilities of changing and expanding to fit your needs. But I mean, I think a lot of what makes a good job is, is what you're willing to put into it. And I think some of the best advice I got when I left my first job and one of the doctors that had been there that I really admired and, and liked working with, what he, the advice he gave me before I started my second job is don't make a decision on it until at least a year. Go there, you spend a year, then you know what you can do there. But I think for both jobs I've worked in, you know, one of the things I've really focused on it is that, you know, if there's something that, that I don't love, it's kind of on me to try to fix it if I can. Right. Yeah. And again, there's not going to be a perfect job. <laughs> I think if you're out there looking for a perfect job, you're never going to find it. You're going to go job to job. That being said, like if you're in a bad situation, you know, there's plenty of jobs out there you can get out of it. So, you know, I don't begrudge anyone who leaves their job if they, you know, need to get to a better situation. I love my job now. I, and there were things about my first job that I loved too, but I, I'm in the right spot for me and still always going to be a work in progress. Like I, I love where I work. It's a good balance for what I'm looking for in a job like you. I'm doing a mix of IR and DR, but despite the fact that this practice has existed much longer than my career, I still have work to do. There's still things that I want to grow. There are things that I want to change in my day to day and I've got work to do. I, you know, you, don't get complacent. Yeah. And you know, these, these practices where you're doing both IR and DR, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that say a lot of negative things about such practices, but I really feel like if you're in a good IR, DR practice that you can really build a wonderful interventional radiology practice. You can practice, you know, radiology and interventional radiology at a very high level. You can have an amazing career. You also maintain that diversity of your skill set, which I think is really important. I mean, you don't want to discount the skill set of being a diagnostic radiologist, not only for being something that will help you be a better interventional radiologist, but it is essentially like a backup career plan if, you know, you were to get partially disabled or something and can't do IR, like you can still practice diagnostic radiology potentially, and it can still be a wonderful career. So, you know, I'm probably in the more the uh, surgical radiologist camp if there was that, uh, that was the Keller's paper on that stuff. So that's just me. But I feel like you can practice really good patient care, even in an interventional radiology, diagnostic radiology type of joint practice. And I want people to know that because a lot of times you hear a lot of these things that, oh, like you just can't practice the way that you should in those sort of environments. And I don't think that that is necessarily true. I think it is true at some places. I don't either. 
it's certainly not where I am. What's really important is having a group that values interventional radiology for what it is and gives you the opportunities to grow and build and that values that. You know, my practice is really good about that. It, it recognizes what we offer both in terms of our contract, but you know, really the practice as a whole. And, you know, you can have a got fully functional clinic, a very diverse practice with plenty of high-end work. And you know what, Dave? Like, I like my diagnostic part of the job. I'm not interested in changing at this point in my career. Yeah. I mean, and every everybody's going to have different opinions about that too. I, I want to respect all those opinions out there because there's going to be different ways to practice. And you're going to have to find a job where you're going to be happy and you can't just find a job that fits all your criteria for professional life, but then not take into account other things like geographical preferences, if your spouse has a preference, if you have kids or family obligations, that sort of stuff. That stuff's really important. And, you know, you can't just look at things just from the professional lens and build your entire life around that. It's just not possible. You're not gonna be you're not gonna be able to make everything you're not gonna be able to make everything work to ten out of ten perfection in each attribute of your life. You may have to accept some eight out of tens and that's okay. I think this is an important thing. And uh, I think it's great for trainees to hear that. And in general, I got, I think it's great for trainees to see, you know, what you've built in this type of practice. It's, it's one of the things that that I'm trying to do as one of the hosts is kind of highlight people who have had really good experiences and done great things in different practice settings. And so I'm glad I got the opportunity to highlight what you've been doing. And, and Dave, I appreciate you taking the time to do this, you know, at night. And uh, I hope I got you out of some of the bedtime duties that you would normally have to do. I'm certainly getting out of mine. And so win-win. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Well, Mike, thank you for having me. I mean, I've always really loved the Backtable podcast. I think it's been a great resource just top to bottom, all the podcasts have really been really well done, not only from the professional, like technical side of things, which is, I think, important as someone who listens to a lot of podcasts, but just from the content as well, which is so difficult to keep getting good guests on. That That is so important. And one thing I would just also add is that I think, you know, out there for anyone who's doing or anyone who wants to do a high volume type practice of a certain type of procedure, like prostate artery embolization in my case, you can do that. You can really find a niche where you can thrive. It really just takes the will to do it and that willingness to play the long game, see things through. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience, but eventually it pays off. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.